The mysteries of Islam fascinate us time and time again. This is no different from the life story of the Prophet. Who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam? An illiterate desert merchant who one day stumbled upon amazing Arabic rhetoric? Or was he the creation of Allah's greatest light, sent down to earth to pull man out of ignorance and bring them to the purest of truths? I, Ali Burji, am on a journey to discover the real story behind the Prophet, the real story behind our religion, the root, the beginning, the cradle of civilization. So doctor, did, um, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to go through uh, this uh, difficult experience of losing both parents? I just want to understand if we are aware of the hikmah, the wisdom behind it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala muhammadin wa alayhi wa tayyibin wa tahirin. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad. Obviously for... Any um, thing that Allah wills, uh, of course, nothing happens except with the will of Allah. Of course, uh, no matter what, uh, anything that happens, uh, it happens with the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran that uh, any leaf, any single leaf that falls off a tree, uh, it will be done by the permission of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And in this, that is recorded, and not only that any drop of rain or any wetness or dryness on earth uh, um, any even dryness or wetness uh, if there is a patch which is wet or dry this is recorded in uh, in the book if you like is uh, it is known Allah knows about it and Allah has decided that that should be in the way so anything that happens is uh, according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing that happens so outside the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly in control of everything everywhere. Exactly. 24-7, uh, every spit of the uh, second. Um, That's quite mind-blowing yeah. if you think about it, I about mean, the power, yeah. the infinite power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? I mean, you need to read this verse of the Quran, if I remember, um, which says that um, anything... Um, that happens, and as I said, any ولا رطب ولا يابس إلا في كتاب مبين. Not anything, any wetness even. وما تسقط من ورقة إلا يعلمها. Even a leaf that falls off a tree, it's known and can by the leaf of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So, which you say, one thing you need to read the Quran, you need to read this particular verse and see and reflect and contemplate about about it to see the significance and the power of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Uh, so there is nothing, no, nothing we have that is coincidence or accident or so on. It's all pre-planned. Uh, in the case of the Prophet ﷺ losing both his parents, this is according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, and وَوَجَدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found you. Uh, you, were, you, had, you were an orphan losing both your parents. And Allah will t uh, took care of you. So this uh, goes according to the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you say whether it was he had won, uh, well, in the, in the probably time before Adam, when the Prophet ﷺ was created, he has probably had informed him of what would happen. Uh, but yes, he basically, the one who took charge of the uh, care of the Prophet ﷺ uh, was uh, his uh, beloved grandfather, Sayyid Abdul Muttalib salam. And but unfortunately, so he, he was taken under the custody of uh, Abdul Muttalib Abdul, of Abdul Muttalib. And now uh, the Holy Prophet remains in Mecca yes, and under the control of Abdul Muttalib and the guardianship in custody, basically. OK. And uh, uh, at which point does Abu Talib salam, takes um, the custody from Abdul Muttalib when he passes away? Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, two years later, just so only two years, uh, at the age of eight, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi loses his grandfather. Okay. Which again, he his grandfather, he was someone that he, from the moment he opened his eyes, he was familiar with his grandfather. Uh, obviously, he never saw his father, 
Um, and uh, this was another devastating blow, if you like, for the Prophet ﷺ, having lost his mom uh, two years Abdul before. Because Abdul was like the father. If you like. He, he's lost his grandfather now. So um, uh, this must have been very uh, okay. uh, painful for him. Uh, very, <coughs> very sad. Can I ask you something? Sorry, sorry to interrupt uh, yeah. before we go on. With regards to um, the parents of the Holy Prophet, like Abdul Muttalib, mm -hmm. would the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam have any sort of, let's say, special treatment? For example, would he be able to be in touch with them, even though they're not in the, in dunya? Would, would he, if he wanted to speak to his mom, for example, would the Holy Prophet, uh, would Allah subhanahu wa taala, if we know? Would he be able to um, uh, communicate with his mom throughout his life? Um, yes, uh, he could. And in fact, um, we do have a report where uh, that uh, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca and he addressed his parents, even though his parents um, were not buried in Mecca. Because his father was buried in uh, Gaza, in Gaza, and his and mother is uh, between Medina and Mecca. Yeah, it's near Medina. Um, okay. Um, okay. Or in Medina, uh, she okay. she she di she died or she passed away when she was on her way to Mecca, but just outside Me Medina. So uh, it's said that he reported to them, and uh, uh, they appeared before him while he was in Mecca. They appeared before him. And uh, he, he saluted them and they responded to him as part of a different, uh, there was an uh, uh, occasion. Uh, he, they responded to him mm. and they went back. So um, it's very interesting that you mentioned that whether he could. He actually, of course he could, there's not a bad, no doubt about it, but the fact that uh, we, there is such a report that the Prophet ﷺ addressed his parents and they responded to him. They appeared, uh, uh, they appeared to him before him. Yeah, that's just, uh, I was curious because inshallah at some point I'd like to go into with regards to the abilities of the Holy Prophet. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what powers and what abilities has he given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he could do. But inshallah that's something we can go later on. Um, well, he's given all the abilities but inshallah we'll Inshallah, I, would, uh, I can't wait to go through yeah. it in detail inshallah. Um, so right now, we have Abdul Muttalib passing away. Mm. What did what effect did that have to Bani Hashim? Because uh, we are aware that at some point we have this change of power. Mm. Bani Hashim is no longer in charge of Mecca like before. Mm. So, w which other tribes or clans were trying to you know because there's some there must be this battle of uh, uh, the power control. Um, Who wanted to get in yeah. charge? What was the situation? Because well, it, it, there, if you like, there wasn't a kind of a change of power. The, the uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, Abu Talib alayhi salam, he was the wasi of the Hujja of the time. That is Abdul Muttalib alayhi salam. Um, so it was, if you like, a smooth, a, a smooth change of power. I wouldn't say change of power. There was no oh, so power. Oh, so transfer to Abu Talib. Yes. He so became, Abu Talib was the Hujja. Yes, now. he became, that's right. He was the Hussein of the Hujja. He became the leader of Bani Hashim. SubhanAllah. And he was highly respected. Okay. He was learned uh, and both, uh, uh, and highly respected both socially at the uh, far afield throughout Quraysh and Mecca. Um, he was responsible for uh, uh, being the custodian of the Kaaba, if you like. Uh, and um, also within Bani Hashim. So there was uh, no problem as such, okay, at that time. Um, um, later on, uh, there are reports that later on he um, gave it to Al Abbas, to so his brother Al Abbas, because uh, he wanted to concentrate and um, he had spent all his wealth for the uh, benefit of the Prophet. So that, uh, there, there was that stage when. Um, because of various reasons, he passed it on to Al Abbas. But anyway, when the Abdul Muttalib passed away, he uh, Abu Talib alayhi salam, or alayhi salam, Abu Talib became the leader, if you like, of Quraysh, and uh, also he was the custodian of uh, uh, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So he was brought into the house. 
Can I just say, I just remember something which I should have yes. said um, in the previous episode. And that was um, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, born um, and uh, um, uh, Fatima bint Asad, the wife of Abu Talib alayhi salam, she was obviously helping with uh, uh, Sayyida Amina bint Wahab alayhi salam uh, when the Prophet was born. Um, afterwards, she took the child, uh, the newborn, to uh, Abu Talib. She gave him the, new, the good news of uh, uh, the Prophet being born. And um, he said, yes, that's very good news. I'm very pleased. And I'm sure you're, you're she was very pleased. Fatima bint Asad, the wife of Abu Talib, uh, she was very pleased. And he said, I give you the good news that you will give birth to his successor. Abu Talib gave her the good news, gave Fatima bint Asad, his wife, the good news Masha that Allah. Uh, she will give birth to, Amir al to the successor of this child. Now, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salam was born 30 years later. Okay? When the Prophet was 30 years old, Amir al-Mu'mineen was born. It goes to show the status and the knowledge and the position of Abu Talib alayhi salam that he was truly the Hujjah, the Wazi of the Hujjah, mm. of course, at that time. And he became the Hujjah. He knew, if you like, the Ghaib. Um, he knew... Uh, that uh, his wife will give birth to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and he will be the successor, he will be the wasi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is quite significant. I mean, uh, people need to, you need to sort of think about it. Yeah, it's something uh, unfortunately uh, because from um, the school of thoughts of uh, uh, Ahlul Sunnah, unfortunately, there's these claims um, which obviously there's so many contradictions when it comes to the background of the Holy Prophet. Mm. And that's mm. something that ideally uh, I'd like to go through with you as well, yeah. uh, discussing of why were these changes made? Why were the um, depiction of these personalities belittled? Yeah. For uh, what, what reason? What was the purpose? And who, who orchestrated this? Yeah. It's basically not really a school of thought. It's as you said, there were individuals they had their own agendas basically they wanted to undermine uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, his teachings his mission uh, basically they were the enemies of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, and the enemy of allah enemy of the religion of islam and they started saying oh the parents of the prophet were uh, uh, Mushrikeen, where they were non-believers. This, of course, started only after the death of the Holy Prophet. This was, of course, Allah. after the death of the Prophet. Okay. So, so they the started accusing, uh, uh, stating that uh, the parents of uh, the Prophet sallallahu were in. They are, because they were Mushrikeen, they are in hell. They are in fire. Mm -hmm. the, the parents of Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, also Mushrikeen, also uh, polytheists, and therefore they are in hell, which of course is totally untrue. Uh, as I said, uh, the evidence there, if you see, th th there's plenty of evidence. Uh, you, uh, basically, the evidence is in, uh, abundantly clear that uh, they were monotheists, they were on the religion of Ibrahim, uh, they knew about the Prophet Sallallahu coming um, in the future, at least at the time when even the Prophet wasn't born. So uh, they were looking forward to it. Not only they did knew who were on the religion of Ibrahim, even the Jews and the Christians knew. The Jews of Mecca and the Jews of uh, Medina knew so about the, the Prophet be coming soon, uh, okay. the Prophet of the end of the time. Even they say, Waraqa bin Nofil, who was the cousin of Sayyidah Khadija, we'll come into that inshallah. He, he was, if you like, Christian, al al al-Masih. Um, uh, he knew that the Prophet is forthcoming. So, uh, but despite that, as I said, the enemies of the Prophet, uh, they started fabricating these in order to undermine the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, undermine the Ahlul Bayt, undermine Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and the position of him by fabricating these um, mm. uh, false stories and uh, uh, spreading them around. And unfortunately, if you like, there were people who were proactively spreading these stories and uh, in order to undermine uh, Imam Ali and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, At that time, one of them was Muawiyah, for example. Uh, he had sworn that, لا والله إلا دفنا دفنا. He had sworn that 
he would do his utmost. He would not rest still until he buries the mention, the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So yes, it's not a school of thought. It's basically a lot of uh, false fabrications which have unfortunately been but they're uh, disseminated. Accepted. They're accepted as facts, whether we like it or not. Unfortunately, okay. a, 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 lot of, a, a lot of untruths are accepted as facts. Of course, yeah. Unfortunately. <coughs> um, so ba back to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Yeah, back to the Holy Prophet. I wanted to stress that uh, uh, Abu Talib alayhi salam, when his wife Fatima bint Asad alayhi salam, she gave him the good news about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I give you the good news that you will give birth to this boy's uh, wasi, this boy's successor. Fatima bint Asad must have been very, very happy. I'm sure she that. was very happy and she was very happy. Well, Would she have been known that or Abu Talib salam, would have informed her? Would she have some Ilm al ghaiba with her or uh, we don't know? Well, we don't know that. At least Abu Talib was there who knew the Ilm al ghaiba and he would pass on yeah, this knowledge okay. to her. Okay. And of course, it is said that after the uh, uh, during the time and after the uh, passing away of her of his mother Amina bint Wahab, Fatima bint Asad was proactively involved in, in caring for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa So how was his life like during those years in Mecca? Now moved to Abu Talib's house. Yes. Um, <coughs> how was it? Yes, he obviously at that early stage when he was eight or nine, he was still being taken care of by within the family. But as he became in his teenage years, he, he got older, he got involved with shepherding. He, he was a shepherd for a while. Mm -hmm. and that's a tradition for prophets, isn't it? Uh, uh, a lot of prophets. For some reason, right. there's a lot of wisdom. <coughs> there's a lot of... Um, because a lot of, of prophets used to be shepherds. Yes. Um, so, yes, uh, along uh, the same line, if you like, uh, the Prophet oh. Muhammad oh. Wa was involved. Oh. Um, oh. Probably at that time, there were very few trades uh, or businesses that you could get involved in. One of them, one of the easiest one is to be, go, be involved in uh, being a shepherd, if you like, because that's something that people depended on for their livelihoods. And they need to, to have uh, um, sheep and camels and so on, and someone needs to take care of them. And of course, afterwards, uh, uh, Abu Talib السلام, started encouraging him to, um, of course, he was very attached to Abu Talib, and it is said that when Abu Talib, on one of his trips, he wanted to go to Sham for, a, for his, uh, uh, on a tr trade trip. Uh, he wanted to leave uh, the Prophet at home, if you like, in, in, Me uh, in his hometown in Mecca. Mecca. And the Prophet was uh, rather sad that he's leaving him. He was very attached to Abu Talib. Right, so he wanted to go with him everywhere. He wanted to go with him. Uh, Subhanallah, he, how... He, um, he was very attached to both Abu Talib and his wife. He used to call Fatima bint Asad uh, mom, so um, he was very attached to this family. And uh, when he wanted to leave, he was very sad. And he could see the sadness, Abu Talib السلام, could see the sadness on the face of the Prophet, this young, uh, or at least he wasn't even a teenager yet, it, it is said that he was about 12. Um, and he decided to uh, take him, take uh, the Prophet along with him. Uh, and he went along again. Uh, people um, uh, in in the Levant, in the Sham, uh, there were again uh, uh, um, scholars who met the Prophet. In this time, there was a, a Christian scholar uh, called Bahira. He, he met him and he could see signs. He said, This young man is not an ordinary young man, he's going, he's going to be a Prophet. Um, and uh, again, um, of course, they were, they didn't spend much time. They were busy. They wanted to go and do the deals and go back quickly. Do we have any um, information regarding his interaction with people? Would he show, for example, uh, one of the signs? Would it be, let's say, the eloquence of his speech? Because we are aware that the prophets and the imams, Ahlul Bayt, السلام, due to the excessive knowledge, that deep knowledge, their eloquence in their speech as well was distinguished because it was different than the normal people. Yeah. Was that something we could witness in the Holy Prophet from a young age or is this something that later on? Um, from what um, is available, at least it, we could come across, uh, it, it came later on. Later on in the sense that when 
the first time at least that I've come across is that when uh, uh, he started doing trading on his own independently of uh, his uncle Abu Talib alayhi salam, uh, the Prophet when he was um, he got in the, he got into a deal with the with Sayyid Khadija Radwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi salam uh, that he he wanted to uh, take some of her money so that he could do a trade. Uh, he went to the Levant, to the Sham, and came back. Sayyidah Khadija, salam Allah alayha, she sent um, one of her workers along with him, and she instructed him to obey the Prophet, to ob obey Muhammad at least, uh, and um, do as he said, and report back to her his performance. It, there it comes about his eloquence, not uh, also about his manners, and, um, uh, and his dealing with the people. Um, and his intellect. All of these were reflected in, 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 in these trips, in these business trips that he did from Mecca to Sham to the Levant. Uh, and um, uh, we can see from the description that um, this um, worker who reported back to Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam about the performance and the deeds and the conduct of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we can see that yes, at that time it became apparent uh, 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 in his inter interaction with the people and the trades that he did with the people in Sham in the Levant. She was known as the Tahira, the pure one amongst Quraysh. This is before she even married the Prophet And she was also referred to as Sayyidah Quraysh if you like, the Queen of Quraysh. <laughs>